We're here in Proverbs chapter 13. We're going to start out with Proverbs chapter 13, verse 15. Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Good sense wins favor, but the way of the treacherous is their ruin. A person with good sense is respected. A treacherous person is headed for destruction. People with good understanding will be well liked. But the lives of those who are not trustworthy are hard. So as we look at this verse, we start out with the first part, that a person of good sense is respected, or that the idea of good understanding. It's the picture of when we start to think through something and understand it, and we act with sense rather than just kind of being unreasonable or just making choices on our own or whatever we feel like. A lot of times the opposite of acting with good sense is acting on our feelings or emotions. And when we act with on our, on our feelings or emotions, often that leads to us doing things that really aren't consistent. Rather than when we act on good sense, it says that we're respected. And here, the second part of the verse talks about a treacherous person is headed for destruction. But what does that mean? Well, the way of the transgressor is hard. I kind of like that in the King James first, as it talks about the fact is those who aren't trustworthy, those who don't live in good sense, they're headed for a hard time. Now, I'm not saying we can't act and emotion at any times, but many times when we don't think through something, we ended up heading towards destruction or problems rather than to take time to think through something and make sense out of something. I mean, we see it all the time today. We see something um, on social media or we see something on TV or we hear something and we all of a sudden we react and respond and we tell somebody else and we don't take time to think through it. You know, was this the right story? Was this truth? Was this accurate? Was it be it sensational, or are we really making good sense out of it? So it's a reminder to us that when we act responsibly out of good sense and don't just act out of emotion and what we feel like at the time, we earn respect. If you think about the people that you respect most, many of them, they are emotional. They do act out of heart and love for compassion for people. But most of the time you respect them because there's a stability there that they make good, sensible decisions. And it's a reminder to us that when we kind of act out of our own feelings or emotions without thinking through it, we can often head towards the hard path. When we take time to make sense of things, we then start to gain that respect and often life becomes a little bit easier when we respond that way. Verse 16. Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly. Every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool flaunts his folly. Wise people think before they act. Fools don't, and even brag about their foolishness. Every wise person acts with good sense, but fools show how foolish they are. So very similar to the verse above, an idea of this prudent man. Now, this is a different term that, that, um, than necessarily wisdom. Wisdom, a lot of times, is translated uh, from different Hebrew words. It's the idea here of prudent is somebody who's really careful about what they do. They're watching. They're caring about how they act. So somebody who really cares about how he acts and he acts with knowledge uh, is going to be somebody who gains, as we saw in the first verse, gains that respect. But the opposite, a fool just kind of just goes and does whatever. They even brag sometimes about their foolishness. They brag about their actions. I saw a story just uh, this week about somebody who had uh, been bragging about how they don't care if they get the, the virus and they'll do whatever they want. And all of a sudden she was really sorry because she actually ended up getting the virus and she was really struggling with it. You know, there's a lot of times we get the idea that, well, I'll just do whatever I want and I'll face the consequences later. We don't think through the process. Go ahead, verse 17. A wicked messenger falleth into mischief, but a faithful ambassador is health. A wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful envoy brings healing. 
An unreliable messenger stumbles into trouble, but a reliable messenger brings healing. A wicked messenger brings nothing but trouble, but a trustworthy one makes everything right. So to help understand this first, we have to realize that in those days they didn't have news, they didn't have internet, they didn't have telephones. When they were sending something, they had to rely on messengers. So if they were out at battle and needed to send something back to the king, they would send a messenger. Now it was very important you send the right messenger because sometimes you would write it down, other times you would give him the message directly and he would quote it. And you want somebody who's going to tell the right truth. You want somebody who's not going to kind of replace that message with another message. You want to have a faithful messenger, somebody you can count on. And here in this verse, it talks about that a wicked messenger falls into trouble. Somebody who doesn't share exactly what they've been told to share. Somebody who's kind of skewing the truth a little bit to be in their favor. And I think that's important for us today because a lot of times we share messages or we share things, whether we share something online, whether we share something over the phone, and we share things and we might not be sharing the exact truth. Or maybe we're kind of bending it or twisting it to our favor and it reminds us to be that faithful messenger. Here it's that you have a faithful envoy, a faithful messenger, a faithful ambassador, they're going to bring healing. So we need to be faithful as we share what we're supposed to share. We're kind of giving messages from one person to another, and in that we need to be honest as how we, we transfer that truth, to transfer the message that we've been given. And I think practically when it comes to us, maybe we've been asked to share something with somebody else. Maybe somebody has told us something and we want to share it with somebody else. Be very wise in that. Is what we're sharing the truth? Is what we're sharing helpful? Is what we're sharing kind of bent to favor us? Or are we giving the truth as it was given to us? Verse 18. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction, but he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. Poverty and disgrace come to him who ignores instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is honored. If you ignore criticism, you will end in poverty and disgrace. If you accept correction, you will be honored. A person who refuses correction will end up poor and disgraced, but the one who accepts correction will be honored. So this is a verse telling us the importance of listening to correction. Or even, I like what it says in the New Living Translation, is listening to <clears throat> criticism. Nobody likes to be criticized, but it's very important many times to listen to it, to be able to learn from it. Now, you've heard me say it many times over and over. There are times where you are criticized, and the person can be 99-some percent wrong, but there's still that fraction of the reason why they thought that, the reason why they said that, there's some truth to it. So it's important that we take and we listen to criticism. We listen to correction. We, we, um, we understand instruction that's given to us. Because here, what does it say? Is we'll have poverty and we'll have disgrace come upon us. We'll run into problems and difficulties. Things will be tougher if we don't learn and grow from the correction and criticism of others. Instead, we need to embrace it. Now, nobody likes to be criticized. Nobody likes to be corrected. Nobody likes to be told they're wrong. But how do we learn? How do we grow? How do we understand if we don't know what we did wrong? Now, it'd be foolish for us if we're making something to make it wrong every time because well, we don't want to listen to how to do it right. And just sometimes we do that with life. We just repeat the same thing over and over because we don't want to listen. We don't want to give in to correction or instruction, what somebody gives us. The opposite is true, though, here. At the end of the verse, it says, Whoever heeds reproof is honored. So those of us who listen to the instruction, who listen to this reproof, those of us who, who are embracing it and accept it, we'll find that we will grow from it, we'll learn from it, we'll be in that position of honor. And no matter where you're at, a lot of times we think the idea of correction is only for 
somebody who's maybe a child or somebody who's a, under somebody else. But really, whether you're under somebody else or in charge of somebody else, it's important to listen to that. Many times as a leader, whether it's me being a father or uh, a husband, I need to be willing to listen to correction. It's not always easy because I want to be right. I mean, don't all of us want to be right all the time? A lot of times we all think we're right all the time. But the reality is, it's that correction instruction that help us grow, that help change us to be more conformed to the image of Christ. And ultimately, the benefit is for us when we listen to criticism and we accept it and we let it change us. Verse 19. The desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is abomination to fools to depart from evil. A desire fulfilled is sweet to the soul, but to turn away from evil is an abomination to fools. It is pleasant to see dreams come true, but fools refuse to turn from evil to attain them. It is so good when wishes come true, but fools hate to stop doing evil. Now this verse seems almost like it's dealing with two different thoughts, but when we stop and when we kind of think about it, it makes a little bit more sense. The first tells us that when we see a desire fulfilled, there's something satisfying. I don't know about you, but I love accomplishing projects. One of the negative parts of my personality, sometimes good, sometimes bad, is I often, when I start something, can't stop until it's finished. Now, most of the time, that's good. But there's some times where it just consumes my mind that I can't even sleep. I know when I've done construction projects before and have been working on a house and have all these things to do, it is so hard to lay in bed at night because all I'm doing is think about all the things I have to do the next day. But you know, when you finish that, it's like, ah, oh, it's done. There's something sweet to be able to accomplish that and to finish that rather than dragging it out. So it's talking about this idea is to, to accomplish and to see it come true and the opposite, though, is a fool kind of, uh, he doesn't want to stop doing his evil. He just wants to keep doing his way. Now, it might not be in direct contrast with what's said in the first part of the verse, but really the idea here is when we choose to accomplish some goal, specifically even think of a spiritual goal, to be able to grow or to be able to understand something. Where a fool will not even have those goals, he'll just go on and do whatever he says and, or whatever he thinks and feels and doesn't change. He refuses to turn. Really, in a sense, the fool refuses to set goals. The fool refuses to try. He doesn't even try to attain these things, and he doesn't feel the satisfaction of accomplishing something. I think it's important for all of us to set different goals, spiritual goals, physical goals, mental goals. We establish these things and we're able to get them there. It's just, it's a great feeling. But the opposite is when we just live life basically based on however we feel that day, that's kind of foolish. We don't have the goals. We don't have that sense of accomplishment. And really what happens is it kind of creates that sense of emptiness. Verse 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Whoever walks with the wise becomes, the, becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. Spend time with the wise and you will become wise, but the friends of fools will suffer. Pretty simple verse, pretty simple understanding. If we choose to hang around other people who are wise, what's going to happen? We'll become wiser. But when we choose to hang around fools, people who act in foolishness, what does it say? We're going to suffer. So therefore, we need to choose who we're going to be our companions. But I think this goes far beyond even friends. Who we're going to choose to be our friends, I think it goes beyond to what we choose to put in our, our minds. So I think it goes to media. You know, what we choose to watch. We put that in our mind that's constantly speaking to us. We're becoming companions with that. When we're constantly listening to things that are foolish, what we're going to do 
is we're going to get ourselves into trouble because we start to think like that. But when we surround ourselves with wise people or fill our mind with wise things, whatever it is we choose to watch, whatever we choose we listen to, the people we choose to hang around, the, the idea is if we do it with wise people, we'll become wiser. If we do it with fools, we'll suffer the consequences. We'll suffer harm. It's a challenge. As you live each day, let other wise people and wise men speak into your life. Now, again, that could be listening to the radio. It could be watching something on YouTube. It could be uh, where you're going to go and who you're going to hang around. Choose to find people around you that are going to help you. Choose to find sources that are going to help you become wiser rather than sources that kind of lead to great foolishness. Verse 21. Evil pursueth sinners, but to the righteous good shall be repaid. Disaster per pursues sinners, but the righteous are rewarded with good. Trouble chases sinners. What well, blessings reward the righteous. Trouble always comes to sinners, but good people enjoy success. So we have a very simple idea that when we choose to sin, now remember we get this term sinners and all of a sudden we kind of like, well, that's not me. But really, when we choose to sin, what's going to be the result is we're going to find trouble. But when we choose to live righteously, what's going to be the result? Our rewards. Very simple truth. Proverbs repeats this over and over, but it's just a reminder. Instead of seeking after these things. Now, it sounds so simple, but when it comes to real life, a lot of times we don't recognize what is sin and what's not sin. That's why it's important to be in the Bible, to be studying God's Word, to know what His Word says, to help decipher. Because if not, it's so easy to get trapped into things that aren't good for us, that are leading us away, rather than things that are righteous, that are leading us towards the blessings that God desires. Verse 22. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinners is laid up for the just. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. Good people leave an inheritance to their grandchildren, but the sinner's wealth passes the, to the godly. Good people leave their wealth to their grandchildren, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for good people. So this is not saying that uh, if you're a really, really great and wonderful person that you're going to to leave a great amount of money for your grandchildren. Sorry, grandkids who are listening to this. It doesn't mean that you have great grandparents who are going to give you a bunch of money. But it does have the understanding that somebody who is acting good and righteously, they're going to gain wealth and possessions that they're going to be able to pass down to generation. But the person who lives in sin and lives in this foolishness the wealth that they have is going to be squandered because they haven't taught the next generation things. They haven't dealt with things in a wise way. They haven't set things up. They haven't laid this foundation. It's important to be able to pass things down to that next generation. So that next generation can have an understanding. That next generation can be able to learn and grow and to be able to carry on. And to be a blessing to them. The people who are righteous, who care about the next generation, who live godly lives, the next generation will make a big difference in the generation after that. But when we kind of live in our own selfishness, that just kind of squanders away and it's kind of a, a wasting it for that next generation. Let's go ahead and uh, read the next verse, verse 23. Much food is in the tillage of the poor, but there is that is destroyed for want of judgment. The fallow ground of the poor would yield much food, but it is swept away through injustice. A poor person's farm may produce much food, but injustice sweeps it all away. A poor person's field might produce plenty of food, but others often steal it away. Now this is an interesting verse. It reminds us of really the injustices that take place in the world. That a poor person could work just as hard, if not harder, 
than somebody else who has a lot, but because of their position in society, it's taken away. So what is this verse teaching us? I think it's a reminder to us to take care and to watch out for the poor, to stand up and to try to help them and not to take advantage of them, but when we see them being taken advantage of, to do what we can because it's an injustice to them because they work so hard. So the picture is that they work so hard to grow this crop and it's produced abundantly, but because they're poor, the rich people could come and just take it away from them and there's nothing they could do. The rich people can bribe their government. They could do other things. And it's a reminder to us that we need to stand up and we need to care for those who don't maybe have a voice, who can't have a voice, to stand up against the injustices in the world. And I'm not talking about the whole world. We have the whole list of things that go on. But the things that we see around us, it's important to be advocates for those who are less fortunate as we see that, that they are taken advantage of. Uh, and to try not to do that ourselves and to try not to, to be a part of that and to stop others from taking advantage of those who are less fortunate. Let me move this up here so it'll be a little bit higher if I can. Verse 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. If you do not punish your children, you don't love them. But if you love your children, you will correct them. This is a simple truth. And as much, so simple it is, it's something that our society really doesn't understand. Many in our society don't discipline their children. They don't discipline others. They, they think, well, I love them too much. I don't want to say no to them, or I don't want to correct them. Or maybe it's just so much work, they don't do it. But even God, several times in Scripture, in the New Testament, as well as the Old Testament, it says that God... Uh, punishes us. God corrects those he loves, those who are his own children. And really that's one of a great sign of love is to correct and discipline your children. Discipline those because it's so important to do that. Now, I realize that many of you that I'm speaking to don't have uh, children, especially young ones at home, but it's a reminder to us. This is a biblical command. It's so important. Because when we don't spare the rod, when we don't spare this punishment, now this isn't the idea of beating somebody so that they, they just hurt so bad. That's not the idea. It's not beating somebody out of anger. That's not the idea of a rod. But it's the idea of punishment and correct them in order to help them make the right choices and right decisions to lead them in the right way of God, the way that God desires. And it's going to be best for them in the long run. It's going to be good for you in the long run. True love also involves discipline and correction. Verse 25. The righteous eateth to the satisfying of his soul, but the belly of the wicked shall want. The righteous has enough to satisfy his appetite, but the belly of the wicked suffers want. The godly eat to their heart's content, but the belly of the wicked goes hungry. Good people have enough to eat, but the wicked will go hungry. So if you remember in Proverbs, the principles aren't necessarily across the board. So if somebody is running out of food, it doesn't always mean they're ungodly. If somebody has a lot of food, it doesn't necessarily mean they're godly. It's the general principle here. That the person who lives in the righteous eats to the point so they satisfy the appetite. But if you look at the King James, it has the idea is it also satisfies the soul. This goes far more than just physical food. Though there is something about physical wealth that normally accompanies people who live in godliness. It doesn't always take place. But many times people who live in godliness, God rewards them and blesses them. And when they're making wise choices, wise decisions, often financially, they're in a state where they, they can eat and be satisfied. But even that, it's that spiritually where we'll have that satisfying of our own soul. 
but the opposite, when we live in wickedness, when we live apart from God. And remember, when we use that term wicked, it doesn't mean just this evil, awful, terrible person. But it's the idea when we live in sin or live apart from God and not according to God's plan, that's when we can find ourselves wanting things. That's when we can find ourselves struggling. And in general, you can see this in society often. Many times those people who, who are more from impoverished areas and don't know the Lord often have less because they've spent their money or they wasted their money on things that weren't good or weren't godly and they've gotten themselves in trouble. Not in every case. There's many rich people. The Bible talks about how hard it is for a rich person to get into heaven. But the idea here is we will be satisfied when we follow the ways of God. Not only physically, but I think spiritually even more. But yet when we go into wickedness, we'll be that continually want, we'll have that hunger that'll have a hard time being satisfied. So the challenge for us is to really seek God and let Him be that satisfaction to our hearts and our souls. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. I pray that each person watching this will take heed to what Scripture has to say. Let it apply to their hearts, bring comfort, encouragement, and help to them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.